Welcome to Hascom Central. I'm Barry Lerner. And I'm Katherine Townsend. We're your Hascom reporters. With today's Hascom report number two, which we call Chemical Safety, Knowing the Hazards. Attention's been focused lately on hazardous chemicals in industry, and there's a very good reason, Catherine. Yes, there is, Barry. It's because the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has issued a document called the Hazard Communication Standard. This new HAZCOM standard requires that manufacturers and importers, as well as users of hazardous chemicals, take certain steps to ensure employee safety around those chemicals. Ah, uh, but what is a hazardous chemical? Previously, that had been a matter of opinion. True, but the HAZCOM standard is changing that, making it very specific. It names names, the names of chemicals covered by the document. There are basic 600 chemicals designated by OSHA. Right, and now we're looking at just some of them. There are likely to be many, many more as the standard is put to work. Yes, because you see, each chemical and each chemical mixture must be assessed by the manufacturer or importer and labeled and otherwise identified on shipment and sometimes further dealt with by the end user. As we begin to realize watching this list, there are far too many hazardous chemicals already designated to deal with individually one by one. They have to be broken down and categorized. Well, Catherine, OSHA has made a start. OSHA names two categories of hazards. But the same chemical can appear in both. That's because of the nature of the two categories, I suppose. Yes. The first category is physical hazards. This includes chemicals which can hurt you by exploding or catching fire or otherwise physically reacting. We've broken the physical hazards down into the categories you see below, expressed in technical terminology. Things that can catch fire or explode or react with other elements to cause a sudden release of energy. And if you're not technically oriented, don't worry about them now. We'll deal with these categories one by one and in simple terms in subsequent HAZCOM reports. The second category named by OSHA is health hazards. They include chemicals which can affect your health adversely. And here are the categories listed below in scientific terms. These are substances that can damage your liver, your brain, your respiratory system, and so on. We're talking about chemicals that can cause damage almost instantly, such as cyanide, but we're also talking about substances that can affect you over a long period of time, such as asbestos, and you may not even know it. These 19 classifications of hazards designated by OSHA in the HAZCOM standard include chemicals that you'll have to be taught to handle and deal with if you work with or even around them in your job. In the meantime, Catherine, it seems that it's not just the chemical itself we have to be concerned about. It's the concentration and the duration and conditions of your exposure to it that matter. In other words, the total exposure. There are some specific terms to define the acceptable exposure that's generally safe for human beings. Bill Wisham has the facts on that aspect of the HAZCOM story. Bill? In the field of hazardous materials, they speak in acronyms like TLVs and PELs. I'm here with industrial hygienist Ben Hardesty, who can translate for us. Ben, just what is meant by TLV? TLV stands for Threshold Limit Value. It was coined uh, by an organization called the ACGIH, which is an acronym for American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. The ACGIH? <laughs> you fellows use a lot of acronyms, don't you? Yeah, we have to. Otherwise, it would take us too long to say something. I can see that. But what about TLVs? Well, ACGIH defines TLV to mean, and this is a quote, the time-weighted average concentration for a normal 8-hour workday and 40-hour work week to which nearly all workers may be repeatedly exposed day after day without adverse effect. Kind of like uh, you can take this much without getting hurt? Kind of. A TLV is a number that an industrial hygienist can use as a guideline to determine the safe level of exposure for a given chemical. Can you give us a specific example of a TLV to make it a little bit more understandable? Sure, I'll try. Let's see. A good example of a TLV is the one for toluene. The TLV is 100 parts per million. That's 100 parts per million in the air we breathe, right? Well, it's really 100 parts per million in the air, but averaged over an eight-hour working day. 
This means that sometime during the day, the exposure to the worker may be slightly higher or lower than the 100 parts per million, but the average dose per day shouldn't exceed 100 parts per million. Most places will keep the average as low as practical, just to be on the safe side. Does a TLV ever change? It sure does, Bill. A new TLV list is published every year by the ACGIH. When new toxicological information or human experience is received that indicates a change is necessary, within a few years, you'll see the TLV change. Then what's a PEL? Is that the same as a TLV? No. No, not exactly. PEL is another acronym that stands for Permissible Exposure Limit. It's used by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, acronym OSHA, as a standard that you can't exceed. The TLV is a voluntary reference, but the PEL has the force of law behind it. So, TLVs and PELs are used to tell us how much and how long we can be exposed to so-called hazardous chemicals without worrying about getting hurt. Yes, you could put it that way. Thank you. So employees in a plant where hazardous materials are either made or utilized should learn more than their ABCs, Catherine. They should be sure to learn their TLVs and PELs as well. Back to you. So. The HAZCOM standard demands that these TLVs and PELs for every possible hazard must be identified and communicated to employees who work around them. So they'll begin to know the difference between a safe exposure and an unsafe one. As you've seen, our research has identified major categories of hazards and the fact that each chemical is allotted a safe exposure limit. But when it was all through, we still came back to a fundamental question of this report. What is a hazard? To get more basic information, we sent our HASCOM reporter, Judd Lindsay, to talk with an authority on the subject. Yes, and we're going to Judd right now. Judd? Catherine, I'm here with Professor Donald Vorstadt, who will try to fill in the chemical gaps in our story. Professor, when would you call a chemical substance a hazard? Well, first, let's talk about the properties of a chemical. Let's go over here. By the properties of a chemical, we mean how it reacts to heat, pressure, agitation, and other external stimuli. When you know the properties of a chemical, then you know under what circumstances it can prove to be, as you say, hazardous. Now, are you talking just about the complex chemicals you'd find in a modern plant? No, I'm talking about all chemicals. Gasoline, for example, such as you put in your car down at the service station. It has many properties, but you're very familiar with one of them, flammability. That property of gasoline can be very dangerous if you're not careful with it. Now, you know not to strike a match or smoke around gasoline because you know one of the properties is flammability, right? Certain chemicals have certain properties that make them dangerous if they're not handled carefully. Yes, that's all we're talking about. And I have identified five properties to be wary of in dealing with any chemical. These are the properties that can cause a chemical to be classified as a hazard? Yes, any one of these properties in a chemical call for extreme care. Now, if a chemical gives off enough vapors at 100 degrees Fahrenheit to support combustion... You mean catch fire and burn? Yes. Then it is said to have the property of flammability. Here we have some examples of chemicals with harmful properties. In the flammable category here, things with the property of being flammable. Now, a chemical which is harmful, even in very small doses, is said to have the property of being toxic. You see some examples listed. I see that hexane is listed in both the flammable and the toxic category. Yes, because hexane has both those properties. Now, when a chemical reacts with skin and eats it away, it has the property of being corrosive. Here are some well-known examples of corrosives. I see a lot of acids in that category. When a chemical has oxygen as part of its composition, and that oxygen can react with other chemicals and ignite and burn, even though no other free oxygen is available, it has the property of being an oxidizer. And here are some examples. Yes, I recognize some of them. And if it explodes easily, of course, it has the property of being an explosive. And you have some examples there. So if you know that a chemical has one or more of these five properties, you need to take precautions in dealing with it, or even being around it for that matter. And these five properties are the properties that make a chemical into a potential hazard? That's a reasonably accurate statement. One final question, Professor. Because they are dangerous, 
Should people try to stay away from using chemicals with these properties entirely? Well, that would be a little awkward. You couldn't use many household cleaners. You couldn't drive your automobile. You couldn't fertilize your lawn. Your girlfriend couldn't go blonde. You couldn't shoot your shotgun. You couldn't do a lot of things you've been doing most of your life. So they're safe to be around? If, big if, you know their properties and take precautions with them. Thank you, Professor. So, we have to be aware of the properties of the chemicals that we use and work with. There are five of them to look out for, and any one of them can make a chemical into a potential hazard. Back to you, Catherine. Thanks, Judd. That gives us a better idea. If a chemical has the ability to hurt someone under inappropriate handling or storage conditions, it's a hazard, Barry. Well, Catherine, it seems to me that the physical hazards are obvious, things that explode or catch fire or eat away at things they contact. But health hazards aren't as easy to perceive. For example, vapors from a certain chemical can be hurting you little by little over a period of time without your even knowing it. Therefore, health hazards also require serious attention. Of course, no chemical is a hazard if it doesn't get to you and inside you. So let's explore just how a chemical can get into your body. There are three ways, and we've illustrated them in this film clip. Yes, first, inhalation. You can breathe the chemical into your lungs from the air around you. This is the most prevalent means of taking in chemical substances. Second, there's ingestion. You can swallow it as part of some other substance. For example, eating with contaminated hands. This is the least prevalent means. And finally, there's absorption. You can absorb it directly into exposed skin. You can take in a chemical through hair follicles or sweat glands. And to very small molecules, the skin is no barrier at all. And you can take hazardous chemicals into your body in any of these ways without knowing you're doing so. Catherine, that gives the impression that we're all easy targets for chemical hazards on or off the job. It does, Barry. So we asked Dr. Hensley Madison, medical director of a large manufacturing facility, to join us. Dr. Madison, with so many ways to take in chemicals, how have we gotten along as well as we have so far? Well, Catherine, I guess you'd say that we're tough. The human body has a marvelous biological mechanism that gives it the capability to handle reasonably large quantity of these chemicals uh, without any problem. Handle them? Yes, uh, the body will inhale or ingest or absorb a potentially harmful chemical, uh, and go to work on it, uh, break it down, uh, usually detoxify it, uh, and that is, uh, render the harmful effects harmless, uh, and eliminate it uh, from the body entirely. Then what is the dangers in these hazards we hear about, Doctor? Catherine, there's a limit to how much a given chemical the body can handle. Now, we call this limit a biological threshold, uh, and it can vary from person to person. Now, if you get too much, uh, say, overexposure, uh, then the chemical can simply overwhelm the body's defenses and work its toxic effect on the body. Doctor, can you give us an example? Yes, uh, there's a very common one, um, alcohol. Now, alcohol is toxic. And yet the body easily handles the alcohol in, uh, say, a glass of wine with dinner. Um, however, if one drinks the whole bottle, well, the toxic effect could be very unpleasant the next morning. Then, Doctor, knowing these exposure limits, the TLVs and PELs and so on, is very important to someone working with or around chemical hazards? Yes, and especially where so-called chronic effects occur. Can you explain that a little further? Certainly. Uh, we classify bodily damage from the ingestion, inhalation, or absorption of hazardous chemicals into two categories. Acute effects, which do their damage quickly and show their symptoms either immediately or within a few days. And chronic effects, which take a long time to do their damage and which only show their symptoms uh, weeks, or months, or even years later. The damage can be going on and the person may not be aware of it, Doctor? In the case of long-range chronic effects, the affected person doesn't know what's happening to uh, him or her, and there's no easy way to tell. Uh, so the main protection against these long-working chemicals is to know the particular chemical and what the exposure limit is, and what we must do to reduce the risk. Thank you, Dr. Madison, for those insights.
As far as acute or immediate effects are concerned, our research has identified some signs and symptoms to look out for. There are four different effects most often experienced by people who've been overexposed to a chemical hazard. Irritation, itching or burning, nausea or dizziness, and trouble with breathing. If you have irritated eyes, nose, throat, or skin, if you have itching or burning of the skin, if you have dizziness and or nausea, if you're short of breath or have trouble breathing, if you experience any of those symptoms, seek medical assistance. Don't pass it off as nothing. Yes, that's extremely important because repeated exposure to some chemicals could cause permanent injury to your health. The new HASCOM document standardizes certain company responsibilities for informing you and training you to deal safely with hazards. But your best protection against chemical hazards is you and your attention to the guidelines set out for dealing with them in the safe manner prescribed. That's right. Simply knowing the hazards won't help you if you don't use your knowledge constantly. But how do you do that? Barry, experts have compiled a list of basic guidelines for personal safety around hazardous chemicals. Here they are. Always wear personal protective equipment. Wash thoroughly after using a hazardous chemical. Keep food and drink away from chemical areas. Don't smoke in chemical areas. Keep emergency areas clear. Remove unused chemicals. Store chemicals in limited quantities and proper containers. Keep incompatible chemicals in separate and secured areas. Dispose of chemical waste strictly according to approved procedures. Know and observe emergency procedures. Never hesitate to get medical attention. Finally, accept all the knowledge you are given about hazardous chemicals in the workplace and put your chemical safety knowledge to work personally. We've been reporting to you on the aspects of protecting yourself by knowing the hazards you face. We looked into the chemical hazards named by OSHA as covered by that standard. We introduced OSHA's two types of hazards, the physical hazards, which release energy, and the health hazards, which release toxicity. We heard about the exposure limits prescribed for various chemicals. We reported on the chemical properties that tend to make a substance dangerous. And on how these chemicals can enter our bodies. And sometimes in small quantities can even be detoxified and expelled without our uh, knowing about it. We learned about the acute and chronic effects and signs and symptoms to look for. Finally, we ran through a list of guidelines and concluded that if you work with or around hazardous chemicals, your best protection is you. In future editions of the HASCOM report, we'll deal with other aspects of the new OSHA standard. For now, I'm Barry Lerner. And I'm Catherine Townsend. We're your HASCOM reporters, and this has been the second of our series of HASCOM reports. Thank you for watching.